wonderful behavior of these young people. It's beautiful. Our subject for this meeting is the loud cry, and our young lady that read the scripture reading for us read the passage that concerns the loud cry out of Revelation 18. I would like to look at the biblical principle upon which the loud cry rests. First of all, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 11. Isaiah 52, verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out from the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. And then the Apostle Paul takes up the strain in 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, and he enlarges on it. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And so there is a principle here of separation from the unclean thing, coming out and being separate from uncleanness, from idolatry. And that is the condition for being received by the Father. I would like to look at a passage here in Great Controversy, God's Final Warning, where Ellen White addresses the issue of the loud cry. First of all, she quotes from Revelation 18, 1, 2, and 4, and I'd like to read that to refresh our minds here to begin with. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now these angels in Revelation 14 and, 11, 14 and 18 represent people who have accepted the message. And Ellen White tells us that these people proclaim this message and the prophecies in the 18th of Revelation will soon be fulfilled during the proclamation of the third angel's message. Another angel is to come down from heaven having great power and the earth is to be lightened with his glory. The Spirit of the Lord will so graciously bless consecrated human instrumentalities that men, women, and children will open their lips in praise and thanksgiving, filling the earth with the knowledge of God and with his unsurpassed glory as the waters cover the sea. So this angel, representing the purity and the power of this message, will lighten the earth with his glory. It will be a very powerful, powerful message as it joins with the proclamation of the three angels' messages. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Now as we read this passage, we are struck with the spiritualistic nature of Babylon, with the occult nature of Babylon. And before I read the passage where Ellen White comments on this, I'd like us to just flip back to Revelation 16. Revelation 16, verse 13, where we see the three parts of Babylon. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Here you have the dragon, spiritualism, the beast, the papacy, and the false prophet, apostate Protestantism that promises salvation in sin. For they are the spirits of devils. So in Babylon, there is going to be a tremendous occult revival, which we are seeing all around us today. The world is going to be wrapped in the folds of spiritualism as well as popery, and this apostate Protestant doctrine of salvation in sin. 
They are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the whole earth and of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So these spirits, these evil spirits that take control of Babylon, and we are told whenever we depart from the word of God, we open ourselves up to the control of evil spirits. They gather the whole earth together to fight against Christ at his second coming. They fight against Christ in the person of his people. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. The great danger is that God's people will lose the garments of righteousness by faith in the midst of this spiritualistic onslaught that attacks them. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Armageddon in Hebrew means mountain of slaughter. So Babylon is gathered together to the mountain of slaughter. Now to great controversy, where Ellen White comments on this passage. Revelation 18, 1, 2, and 4 she is commenting on, and she says in page 603, 604, this scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon, as made by the second angel of Revelation 14, in verse 8, is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. So the loud cry of the angel of Revelation 18 consists of the reinforcement of the second angel's message with additional mention of the developments that have been taking place within Babylon, within the various organizations that constitute Babylon. A terrible condition of the religious world is here described. With every rejection of truth, the minds of the people will become darker, their hearts more stubborn, until they are entrenched in an infidel hardihood. In defiance of the warnings which God has given, they will continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue until they are led to persecute those who hold it sacred. Christ is set at naught in the con contempt placed upon his word and his people. As the teachings of spiritualism are accepted by the churches, the restraint imposed upon the carnal heart is removed, and the profession of religion will become a cloak to conceal the basest iniquity. So the churches will accept the teachings of spiritualism. I have a close friend who came out of the Lutheran church in North Dakota a number of years ago. Some relatives from East Germany came visiting after things were freed up in, in eastern Germany and visited the family in North Dakota. And the father, who was an elder in the Lutheran church, prevailed on my friend to visit the Lutheran church. He visited it and he went out of that service in shock with the New Age teachings that had been preached that morning in that church. He wished he hadn't have gone. But spiritualism ha has entered the churches and it breaks down the restraint on the carnal heart and a belief in spiritual manifestations opens the door to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and thus the influence of evil angels will be felt in the churches. Now Ellen White said, commenting on the second angel's message in early writings, that evil angels even at, in her day there were crowding into the churches. They are crowding into the churches. Now, there is a very all-pervasive form of spiritualism which has been taught in our church for about 20 years now. Ellen White commenting on it speaks of it in Great Controversy 488 and 489. It is true that spiritualism is now changing its form and veiling some of its more objectionable features is assuming a Christian guise, but its utterances from the platform and the press have been before the public for many years and in these its real character stands revealed. These teachings cannot be denied or hidden. Even in its present form, so far from being more worthy of toleration than formerly, it is really a more dangerous because a more subtle deception. While it formerly denounced Christ in the Bible, it now professes to accept both. But the Bible is interpreted in a manner that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart, while its solemn and vital truths are made of no effect. Love is dwelt upon as the chief attribute of God, but it is degraded to a weak sentimentalism, making little distinction between good and evil. 
And this is this love gospel that has swept the churches. And not just our church, but all the churches. It's this love and unity message which came particularly out of Vatican II. Love is dwelt upon as the chief attribute of God, but it is degraded to a weak sentimentalism, making little distinction between good and evil, and the Bible is interpreted in a manner that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart. So there is not a message that comes across that cuts across the carnal heart, you see. The Bible is interpreted in a manner pleasing to the unrenewed heart. Now, this afternoon, I'd like to get into a little of the history of the celebration movement and uh, some of the things that we've discovered in our research. We discovered that uh, the concept of celebration is a concept that Rome has held for hundreds of years, uh, way back at the Council of Trent, which was the main council of the Counter-Reformation, where the Roman Catholic Church gathered to regroup and to launch its assault on Protestantism. The various sessions of this council were called celebrations. And here I read a bull for the celebration of the Council of Trent under the Supreme Pontiff Pius IV. And all the sessions were called celebrations. The ancient mystery religions were called celebrations. And as we come down in time, to the uh, Spanish, the time of the Spanish Inquisition, I have here the uh, history of the Inquisition of Spain. This is one of four volumes. This is volume three by Henry Charles Lee. And Henry Charles Lee it was a Quaker, and he was considered to be one of the greatest authors that America has produced. And he has a whole section on this in this volume three of the celebration the most holy and pious celebration of the Roman Catholic Church, which was the celebration of the auto de fe. The auto de fe was the burning of heretics at the stake. And the reason why Rome considered this her most holy and pious celebration was that in this service, she showed God and the world her utter abhorrence of heresy and heretics and her intent to completely exterminate heretics. You get the impression from reading this that life under the Spanish Inquisition was a life that was regulated by the celebrations of the church. In the celebration of the auto de fe, there would sometimes be a thousand notables that would march to the place of the burning. There would be drapes hung from the windows, and the king would oftentimes be present. Everything about it was calculated to impress the people with the magnitude of the service and the church's utter abhorrence of heresy. And then they arrived at the place where the people were to be burned, and sometimes some of the people lost their nerve when they saw the stake, and they would appeal to the inquisitors for reconciliation to the church. And then the inquisitors would go into a huddle, and they would uh, decide whether or not to admit them to be reconciled, and they spoke of them being condemned to reconciliation because, according to Roman Catholic canon law, the canon law prescribed that for a person who had been involved in heresy, if they were admitted to reconciliation, they had to spend the rest of their days in prison. So once a person was suspected of heresy in the Spanish Inquisition, if they were slated for being burned at the stake, and the church tried to cover it all by saying they handed the person over, they relaxed them to the civil power. And the civil power, of course, was under the power of Rome. And in, in uh, continental Europe, where Roman Catholic canon law held sway in the courts and was the dominant influence in the courts, a person could be arrested in the middle of the night on mere suspicion of heresy, he could be dragged off to prison or who knows where. There was no habeas corpus like England developed. See, English common law developed a whole system of law which was calculated to resist the Inquisition. In fact, Hen uh, Charles, Le uh, uh, let's see, uh, Leonard Levy, I didn't bring his book along this time. Leonard Levy, who won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for his writing, one of the top scholars of our country, 
did a work on the origins of the Fifth Amendment. That's the right to not incriminate yourself. And he goes back five centuries, and he shows side by side the two systems that were struggling, systems of law. And under the Inquisition, the inquisitor, the judge, could mere, on mere rumor or suspicion arrest a person, and the relatives could, had no way of finding out where he had gone. They had no habeas corpus. Habeas corpus means, here is, you, I have the body, or here is the body. The jailer is required to show the body and why the person is in prison. But there is no such thing under canon law. And then the judge would investigate oftentimes himself and use torture to try to elicit a confession. And the person could be put to death and the relatives never even knew what happened. They had a system all across Europe of, of keeping records of heretics for generations. And if any heretics tried to escape, why they had communications and records all across Europe so that a person could be apprehended. And even a person who looked strange coming into town could be suspect and could be dragged into the Inquisition. And according to Leonard Levy, there is no case of a person ever coming out unscathed that once got in the toils of the Inquisition. So people were so intent on trying to prove their orthodoxy and that they were not heretics that they would turn other people in because one of the proofs of conversion to Roman Catholicism was the betrayal of other people. And that way, sometimes they would reap a harvest from one person of hundreds of other people that could be arrested. And it suppressed intellectual activity. It was like a pall over all of Europe. And so, the person who might lose his nerve at the stake and who would recant would be condemned to prison for the rest of his life according to Roman Catholic canon law. So a person in that condition had the option of either being burned at the stake and having the hope of eternal life if he was faithful or if he recanted spending the rest of his life in prison. I don't think I'd have too much trouble with that decision. Page after page on the celebration. Incidentally, I was recently shown a letter by a lady, faithful Seventh-day Adventist lady, who was so filled with abhorrence of uh, the neuro-linguistic programming and celebration activities in the local church that she spoke out against it to the pastor and uh, took various measures. And the pastor uh, finally sent her a letter asking her if she would like to be admitted to a process of reconciliation. I never remember that growing up as a boy. A process of reconciliation. And it sounds a little bit too much to me like, like what I'm hearing out of Roman Catholicism as well as the celebration movement. Well, as we come down closer to our time, I'd like to uh, look at the documents of Vatican II. Now, in Vatican II, uh, the Pope... Uh, Pope John the 23rd call, called on January 25, 1959 for an ecumenical council to be held. Now, to just get the setting, Adventism has just been through a tremendous upheaval in the 1950s with, with Donald Gray uh, uh, Barnhouse and Walter Martin coming to the General Conference. Walter Martin was working on his advanced degree and he had a, a list of questions and Donald Gray Barthouse was uh, editor of Eternity Magazine and they had a number of questions to submit to the brethren. And they were amazed to find out that the brethren were suppressing the third angel's message about the mark of the beast. In fact, it was right after that that the Sabbath School Lesson Quarterly on the book of Revelation omitted Revelation 13. And they were quite amazed to find also that the brethren were prepared to completely shift our position on the nature of Christ in an effort to be relieved of the onus of being a cult. And so while this type of thing was going on, in 1958 over in Europe, the Dutch Reformed theologian, G.C. Burkauer, thundered a warning to the world in a book that he wrote recent developments in Roman Catholic thought in which he said that if the Protestant world does not cling to the Bible and learn to say with reference to the Bible, we know 
based on the word, based on, on an experience in the Bible, they will fall back into the arms of Rome and her authoritative ex-cathedra decrees. Because humanity, he said, is looking for authority. And if they don't have the authority of the word, they're going to fall back into the authority of Rome. So that solemn pronouncement came out. I have his book. And then in 1959, Pope John XXIII calls uh, an ecumenical council called Vatican II. Vatican II met from 1962 to 1965. It would forever change the face of the religious world. In the 1950s, there was an attempt to send an ambassador over to the Vatican. But 8,000 ministers across denominational lines in America rose up as one man and said, no way are we sending an ambassador to the Vatican. But what happened when Reagan tried it? Oh, it was a very tepid response. A few little feeble voices were raised. A complete change had happened, and much of that was due to Vatican II. Well, I bought Vatican II when I was at the seminary the first time, and I believe it must have been 1975. And when this celebration thing was bursting on the scene, one evening I was passing through my library and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to lay hands on some top secret Jesuit documents that would tell us what their plans of infiltration are. And I thought, I don't have such documents and I don't really know how I could get a hold of them, but maybe it's worth just seeing what they might have published. And so I pulled down this book. I had bought it years before, thinking that someday it might be valuable research material. I opened it up and my eyes just about popped out of my head because in the first section on the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, virtually every page had the word celebration, celebrant, or some derivative of celebration. And I went through and counted 536 times in that one section of the Vatican II documents. And right on the first page, I read this, that this sacred council has set out to impart an ever-increasing vigor to the Christian life of the faithful, to adapt more closely to the needs of our age, those institutions which are subject to change, to foster whatever can promote union among all who believe in Christ, to strengthen whatever can help to call all mankind into the church's fold. What church is that? What church is there, according to the Roman Catholic Church? Accordingly, it sees particularly cogent reasons for undertaking the reform and promotion of the liturgy. So, Rome felt that the hour had struck to reform and change her liturgy for the purpose of bringing all mankind back into the church's fold. Now, what did she do? She called for many changes, and we cover this in our, uh, cover at least some of it in our uh, third issue of Freedom's Ring in volume one. But Rome was interested in developing a popular service that would use musical celebrations as a chief tool for bringing the other churches back into Rome. They would be considered the most effective celebrations, the sung or musical celebrations, and they would utilize popular religious songs, which was quite a revolutionary idea 25 years ago. And I have some good Catholic Adventist friends. They were Catholics, now they're Adventists. And uh, they tell me that in 1967 about, right after Vatican II, they suddenly noticed a change in their services. Suddenly they had a part of the service where everybody stood up and shook each other's hands or hugged each other, and they brought the guitars in, and they brought many, uh, the drums even in, and they brought a big change in the service. Now, the services were to include a lot of verbal response from the congregation, and one thing that was considered a must was lots of bodily movement. And... Uh, there was to be as much variation used in the celebration services as possible to encourage active, willing participation. And then a very important part was to narrow the gap between the Roman Catholic Eucharistic celebration and the Lord's Supper, soon to be called a communion celebration in the other churches. Educating the people that this service 
forms the basis of all Christian unity and fellowship. So these revitalized, reformed services now, and on page 46 of the Vatican II documents, we read this. It says, further, the general reform of the liturgy will be better received by the faithful if it is accomplished gradually and if it is proposed and explained to them properly by their pastors. Now, it was to be a gradual conditioning process even within the Church of Rome, as well as something that was extended to other churches in an effort to get them all together, to foster union, to foster a coming together, and to ultimately bring the churches together on the Eucharistic service, which is the foundation of unity, and then they were to demonstrate the inextricable tie-in between the Eucharistic celebration as the foundation of all unity and the Lord's Day celebration, which is Sunday. And they were to perform any endeavor necessary to promote Sunday observance involving rest from work. Now, what happened after Vatican II is very, very interesting because the World Council of Churches and the Charismatic Movement take up this agenda that was laid out by Rome at Vatican II. These celebration services of Rome are called in the Vatican II documents sacred celebrations, sung celebrations, celebrations of the Word, celebration of the Eucharist, celebrating the Mass, liturgical celebrations, worthy celebrations, funeral celebrations, and we've had funeral celebrations in our church. Uh, it happened in my parents' own home church, funeral celebration. Academy principal died, they had a funeral celebration, and right in the middle of the funeral celebration was a, I, I got the bulletin from it, was a section that said the reason for the celebration. Now the Vatican II documents said that the pastors were to explain the reason for the celebration as the changes were introduced. And here, almost word for word, in fact, in the International Council, uh, the Me International Meeting on Worship that was held in the Northwest recently, I saw the advertisement for it. And there are the pictures of the various speakers and a little one sentence or one phrase clip emphasizing the point they were planning to make at the meeting. And virtually every one of those sentences or clips was taken right out of the Vatican II documents or Roman Catholic materials. I was astounded when I saw that. And the reason for the celebration was given by the secretary of the conference. Funeral celebration, celebration of the Paschal Mystery, celebration of Sunday, celebrate the Lord's Supper, celebrating the sacrament of matrimony, celebration of the divine office. I found some pages where there were 12 or 14 references to celebration in the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. Now that's only one section of the Vatican II documents. There's many other sections that are very interesting to analyze and compare. Now, Ellen White tells us that it is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. And she tells us in Great Controversy 289 and 290 that the English reformers, while renouncing the doctrines of Romanism, had retained many of its forms. Thus, though the authority and the creed of Rome were rejected, not a few of her customs and ceremonies were incorporated into the worship to the Church of England, of the Church of England. It was claimed that these things were not matters of conscience, that though they were not commanded in Scripture and hence were non-essential, yet not being forbidden, they were not intrinsically evil. Their observance tended to narrow the gulf, which separated the Reformed churches from Rome, and it was urged that they would promote the acceptance of the Protestant faith by Romanists. To the conservative and compromising, these arguments seemed conclusive. Now, she's meaning conservative with reference to following truth. But there was another class that did not so judge. The fact that these customs tended to bridge over the chasm between Rome and the Reformation was, in their view, a conclusive argument against retaining them. They looked upon them as badges of the slavery from which they had been delivered and to which they had no disposition to return. They reasoned that God has in His Word established the regulations governing His worship and that men are not at liberty to add to these or to detract from them. So they looked to the Word of God as their one source 
for how to conduct their worship services. The very beginning of the great apostasy was in seeking to supplement the authority of God by that of the church. That means just adding the authority of the church on to the word of God. Rome began by enjoining what God had not forbidden, and she ended by forbidding what he had explicitly enjoined. So the Vatican Council was concluded in 1965, and in 1966, the Catholic charismatic movement begins exploding. And did it ever explode? Here is a book by Edward D. O'Connor, CSC, The Pentecostal Movement in the Catholic Church, The Definitive Study of a Dynamic Spiritual Rebirth from the Standpoint of Catholic Theology, Its Significance in Catholic Life and Thought Today. In this book, <clears throat> he describes how the movement got started right after Vatican II, and he goes into even a description of the Garden of Prayer service, which we are experiencing today in our churches. And so, there you have a definitive book on the Catholic charismatic movement that began exploding. It wouldn't be long and there would be a million Catholic charismatics. And ultimately, the Curcio movement would be brought in where uh, they would have retreat <coughs> training for Catholics into, as to how to be charismatics. And uh, they, would, they would be training Roman Catholics in how to have a network all across the world of charismatic contacts. <clears throat> in 1968, the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Vatican Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity join a significant arm of the World Council of Churches called the World Confessional Families, now called the Christian World Communions, and that's in this Dictionary of the Ecumenical Movement, pages 919 and 157. <clears throat> For years, a Seventh-day Adventist has been seated on the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches, and I talked to the director of the Faith and Order Commission, Dr. Gunter Gossman, over in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, on the telephone, and he tells me that every member is seated on that commission in a personal capacity. We have been told for some time in our church that, that our member on the commission somehow had a different status. He was seated there in a personal capacity. But Dr. Gunter Gossman tells me that everyone is there on a personal capacity, which is very enlightening and very interesting. By the way, he was very pleasant to talk to. I don't agree, of course, with the work he's doing, but I uh, had a good visit with him. Faith and order serves, quote, serves the churches by leading them into theological dialogue as a means of overcoming obstacles to and opening up ways towards the manifestation of their unity given in Christ. That's out of the Dictionary of the Ecumenical Movement, pages 411 and 919. This is quite a book, incidentally, very valuable book on the uh, ecumenical movement. World Council of Churches, their involvement in the United Nations. I tell you, there are connections there that I never dreamed were there a few years ago. There are many, many agencies working together to accomplish something very big for this world. In 1974, <clears throat> secret high-level union between the Catholic and Protestant charismatic movements takes place, and this took place in what is called the Council. Sarah Diamond, who is a sociologist, wrote this very penetrating book, Spiritual Warfare, The Politics of the Christian Right, a very, very enlightening book and very, very significant. She goes into cell groups and shepherding the shepherding cell group movement and the Catholic charismatic communities that have uh, been established, high-level training sources, and she goes into how the leaders didn't tell the, their followers in the Catholic and, charisma, uh, Catholic and Protestant charismatic communities what they were doing at first. They joined together at first, and it was only gradually that through their magazines, such as Charisma and New Covenant, that they brought the two movements together. 1977, B.B. Beach 
who is representing the Seventh-day Adventist Church at a consultative meeting of secretaries of the World Confessional Families, which we joined in 1968 along with the Vatican, held in Rome, gives a gold medal with Catholic symbolism on it to Pope Paul VI on May 18, according to the review, August 11, 1977. In 1981, Father Brown gives the keynote address at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship World Convention. A Catholic priest gives the keynote address at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship World Convention. And the Vatican Charismatic Movement monthly publication in the 1980s, New Covenant, mirrors the Protestant Pentecostal paper, Charisma. The two papers are almost identical in the message that they have. And here I have a book by a uh, Bible Baptist minister up in the Northeast where he shows pictures of the, the two uh, magazines. The, you probably can't see that at the distance you're at, the Charisma and New Covenant magazines. And these magazines and other literature of like fashion were used to bring the constituency of the Protestant charismatic movement and the Catholic charismatic movement together. <clears throat> in 1982, a Protestant, uh, a prominent Seventh-day Adventist systematic theologian who is sitting on the Faith and Order Commission adopts the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry document along with over a hundred other theologians for transmission to the churches, for the churches to analyze and come back with their responses. Now, it was not expected that the churches would all come back with 100% acceptance of this document. It is looked upon as a process, a process of coming together. If uh, Luther is here, if he could get me a drink of water, please. A process of coming together. We read on the back page of this, the statement published here marks a major advance in the ecumenical journey the result of a 50-year process of study and consultation. <clears throat> this text on baptism, Eucharist, and ministry represents the theological convergence that has been achieved through decades of dialogue under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Over 100 theologians met in Lima, Peru in January 1982 and recommended unanimously to transmit this agreed statement, the Lima text, for the common study and official response of the churches. They represented virtually all the major church traditions, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Old Catholic, Lutheran, Anglican, Reformed, Methodist, United, Disciples, Baptist, Adventist, and Pentecostal. The church's response to this agreed statement will be a vital step in the ecumenical process of reception. So it's not looked upon as something that all the churches will either vote in favor of or not. It's a process of reception, a process of coming together. And the churches would come back and would give their response and their reaction, the things that they could agree with and the things that they disagreed with. And uh, in this document, in the section under the Eucharist, <clears throat> which of course was a big point, as you recall, in the... Uh, in this Second Vatican Council. Thank you, Luther. In the main text, we read the words and acts of Christ at the institution of the Eucharist stand at the heart of the celebration. The Eucharistic meal is the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, the sacrament of his real presence. The Roman Catholic Church believes that in the wafer that is elevated, and the priest says, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body, that the priest creates the creator, and that wafer contains the very body, bones, all the physical element of Christ. <clears throat> the real presence of Christ. And that's what is called transubstantiation. Now the commentary is, waters it down a bit and tries to kind of leave the door open, and much of the talk of the World Council of Churches is quite ambiguous like that because they want to leave the door open for negotiations and, and coming together. Now, it's very significant, I think, that 
that immediately after the uh, baptism, Eucharist, and ministry document came out. Right away, Carl Rayner, the top Jesuit scholar of the century, gets on this document and he produces his book, Unity of the Churches, an actual possibility, and that book comes out the very next year in 1983. He co-authors it with Heinrich Fries, who is a, an, a Roman Catholic ecumenical uh, theologian. He says, well, it says here in the introduction to the English edition, which came out a year or two later, that this book is a product of seasoned scholars, that's uh, Rayner and Fries, building on the earlier work of the Second Vatican Council, which we just talked about. So it, this book builds on the Second Vatican Council, the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches, dialogues and theological reflection in world confessional families like the Lutheran World Federation. Notice the world confessional families, which we joined in 1968. Now, this book merits a whole, a whole section of time in and of itself because it is a book that lays out the strategy of Rome as to how there can be a world, one world church, where every church retains its own structure. I'd like to just hit a few of the points here. Thesis number one that Rayner and Fries uh, bring out is the, that the fundamental truths of Christianity as they are expressed in Holy Scripture, in the Apostles' Creed, and in that of Nicaea and Constantinople are binding on all partner churches of the one church to be. Now this is the same kind of argument that Ellen White records in Great Controversy, page 42, that was used in the formation of the papacy. Quote, with some concessions on their part, they proposed that Christians should make concessions that all might unite on the platform of belief in Christ. Doesn't that sound wonderful? But you see, Christ is always accompanied by his word. And if the Christ is not accompanied by his word, it's another Christ. And Ellen White, as you recall, commenting on that, says that the Waldenses came to the place where they said, you know, we are not going to compromise to have peace. And if there's going to be, if that means war, so let it be. The one church to be is a possibility only if it is a community of faith, Heinrich Fries comments. The individual receives his faith by way of the community of faith. Notice the concept. You get your faith through the community of faith, through the church, you see. And the Waldenses reacted against this document in volume two of churches respond to BEM, the official responses, the good old Waldenses said that this document is, is, uh, uh, it goes in a direction which is the opposite to the direction it should go. And that uh, this document, let me see if I can find it here. Well, maybe I can't find it right off here, but, but they said that this document of the BEM document is going in a direction away from God and the gospel and is setting up a concept of the grace of Christ only coming through the church. Yes, that's in this document too. The, the Seventh-day Adventist responded here on page 337. Now, that's a point that I'm wanting to make here because uh, I'll get to it in just a second. Uh, our comment on this first thesis is that the, a fundamental theme of the Jesuit scholars is the community of faith. It's a favorite term that they use. And in this view, the church takes precedence over the individual, and theology can only be done in and by the community, not by individuals. Now, we had an article in the Adventist Review entitled, an editorial, unsafe, even dangerous, which enunciated this principle of the Jesuits very clearly. 
that theology can only be done in and by the community, not by individuals. What about Moses that wrote Genesis out in the wilderness and the book of Job? You see, they want to control the development of theology. And Noah, did he develop his doctrine along in a community of faith? Or was it a message that God gave him about the flood? Certainly, he did not consult with an apostate community of faith. And this does not mean, of course, that we don't consult together. But the Protestant principle is the priority of individual conscience. Then, thesis number two of of uh, Rayner and Fry's is that nothing may be rejected decisively and confessionally in one partner church which is binding dogma in another partner church. In other words, of all these partner churches in this world church to be, Seventh-day Adventist church would not be able to condemn any dogma that is in the Roman Catholic church and vice versa, you see. No one condemns anything. Sounds like real love, doesn't it? That's their concept of love. But you look at what's happening. Are we as a people speaking out against Rome and about the issue of the Sabbath Sunday? Or is this being suppressed, you see? So that's another point. Uh, and uh, in commenting on this thesis number two, Carl Rayner uses a, ver uses a very interesting argument to support this thesis, which the spirit of prophecy years ago declared would take place. Rayner's argument is that the information explosion has in our day created a qualitative and quantitative upheaval so great that one can no longer depend upon his own study to form his conclusions and worldview. On page 28, Rayner says, as an individual, one becomes ever more impotent, one has to depend more and more on the knowledge of others, which one can no longer assimilate or check oneself. So you have to depend on other people's judgments. You can't even assimilate that knowledge, and you can't even check their judgments. Just depend on the experts, you see. And the only ones that Rainer might grant as approaching mastery of the field of theology are, quote, among the few in the Roman congregation of the faith, which used to be called the Holy Office of the Inquisition, who much must watch over and judge the orthodoxy of other theologians' doctrines, page 29. So what is the point? The point is that the individual is rendered impotent by the information explosion, therefore must put his trust in the church, for, quote, the church itself is the guarantor through, through its formal teaching authority of the truth of the individual doctrines it presents. The church guarantees the doctrines that it presents through its teaching authority. You see, just accept that. That's the papal concept. Ellen White wrote, quote, a day of great intellectual darkness has been shown to be favorable to the success of the papacy. It will yet be demonstrated that a day of great intellectual light is equally favorable to its success. The false science of the present day which undermines faith in the Bible will prove as successful in preparing the way for the acceptance of the papacy with its pleasing forms as did the withholding of, the, of knowledge in opening the way for its aggrandizement in the dark ages. So Ellen White foretold that that very argument would be used, that very principle would be accepted. And then the Jesuit goes on to call for the Protestants to just suspend their judgment. He says... If a person withholds an affirmative verdict regarding a true or certainly or possibly proposition, he does not err. And that this kind of an epistemological position would function for partner churches just as it presently does within the Roman Catholic Church. All through the book, it's clear that he is using the model of the operation, the ecclesiastical operation within the Roman Catholic Church, that it would be extrapolated out over the other churches as the way in which this world church to be would be accomplished. And uh, so he says that uh, the, uh, the Protestant Christian can most certainly assume that hopefully in the course of the further history of religious consciousness, these Catholic propositions will obtain the kind of clarification and interpretation that will permit a definite agreement on his part with not yet possible today without his having to feel duty bound to reject them directly. So he calls for the Protestant Orthodox churches to merely reserve judgment. Don't judge. 
This epistemological tolerance means that one makes a room for the not yet agreed upon, but nevertheless acknowledged as agreed upon. In other words, just agree even though you haven't yet agreed. Sounds like a good device for unity, doesn't it? Therefore, the Protestant is called upon to agree in advance upon things that he does not presently agree upon. Rayner concludes this argument by observing that since this is the only way that unity can be achieved, it must be legitimate. What logic? Then he brings in a very interesting point. And he says there is an even more radical unity of faith that is achievable. He says that this is the avenue of whole groups of believers just declaring their lack of interest in certain doctrines. Page 38. For Rayner, this would be an even more ideal unity of faith. It would be even better than having to agree on things that you haven't really agreed on yet to just say, look, we're bored with these doctrines. They're not significant anymore. And look, we'll just unify. And boredom is a major weapon, incidentally, of neurolinguistic programming. Milton Erickson used boredom as one of his major weapons to accomplish hypnotism. The books on neurolinguistic programming by uh, Grender and Bandler tell us. So Rayner believes that the sheer boredom and lack of interest in doctrines provides for a radical unity of faith among the churches. In light of these things, one cannot help but reflect upon years, yes, decades of preaching in our church in which the members have been bored to tears and which have tended to convince our members that our doctrines were not significant. They weren't interesting or crucial. In fact, I have heard sermon after sermon where doctrine was downplayed. We well, just need Jesus. Have you heard that? But what does the Bible say? Give heed unto sound doctrine. In doing so, thou wilt both save thy soul and the souls of others. And Jesus comes with the truth. The spirit of truth is his advocate. So all this boredom and playing down of the doctrines plays decisively into the hands of the Jesuits of Rome. And the Jesuits even announce it in their book. Now another development is... Rayner says, actually, the only requirement is that these other churches not reject out of hand an explicit doctrine of the Catholic Church as being irreconcilable with the fundamental substance of their Christianity. In other words, don't just reject anything in our church. Leave the door open for negotiation, for ultimately accepting it down the line. The development of ecclesiastical consciousness in all the churches has progressed to such an extent that this is possible, he says, page 39. Note that the Jesuit is primarily concerned with the development of ecclesiastical consciousness. This is another way of saying the development of the thinking of the church leaders. He says it has reached that kind of a point. And then in the thesis number three, in this one church of Jesus Christ composed of the uniting churches, there are regional partner churches which can, to a large extent, maintain their existing structures. These partner churches can also continue to exist in the same territory. Since this is not impossible in the context of Catholic ecclesiology or the practice of the Roman church, as for example in Palestine. So you notice Rome is not really giving anything up in this whole thing. They're just taking what operates already in their church and saying, look, we'll extend this out to the rest of you. You keep your structures, but you just function in harmony with us. The Jesuit plan for the one world church calls for the partner churches to maintain their existing structures. Rayner declares unification results in a more encompassing Catholicity if it retains independent partner churches. He says it's even better if all of these churches retain their a measure of independence. Thus the possibility, indeed the desirability, and I'm quoting, of a legitimate pluralism within the church of particular churches with their own liturgy, their own constitution, and their own theology is an integral element of a Catholic concept of the true unity of the church. The issue in Thesis 3 is pluralism with respect to the structure and discipline of the individual partner churches. So we'll have pluralism. And that's what this book from Roman Catholic University is, Blessed Rage for Order the, Order, the New Pluralism in Theology. So we'll just have pluralism. And we have found in our periodicals and among our college professors of theology a great interest in pluralism. In fact, after Ford, 
was uh, the Ford issue on the sanctuary was addressed at Glacier View. Right after that, there were 19 college professors from our colleges in North America that met in Atlanta and signed the Atlanta Manifesto calling for pluralism of theology in the, Roman, in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Pluralism. Now, what's that? Pluralism. There will be many different strands of theology, you see. And in the current, in that setting of the Atlanta Manifesto, what they were really saying was, we've got to make room for the new theology in the church. We don't need to just have one theology. And when the current ministry editor assumed his new post, his first editorial was about the need for pluralism in the Seventh-day Adventist church. I see our time is running out. I'm going to just do something different here and just cut right here and we'll pick up with this chronological development. I wanted to get into the world, the, the uh, Jesuit plan for the world church to be because it's very significant for what is happening within our own church. And we'll pick up with that and then come on down through time with developments of celebration, charismatic movement, neurolinguistic programming, and the spiritual exercises in the next meeting. It would take too long. It's pages. But here's another point. One of the big points that is brought out in Unity of the Churches by Rayner is that the necessity for a creed, you see. Once a church develops a creed, that church has something that Jesus can work with. Because the creed can be changed and modified and, uh, and adapted and brought together, you see. And that's why the Bible is to be our only creed. Once you develop a creed, like 27 Fundamental Beliefs has basically become that if you read the editorials. That's basically become a de facto creed for us. And a creed can be altered and changed. And the new theology knows that they only have to wait long enough and get enough people who are involved in the formulation of new fundamental beliefs and it can be brought ever closer into line with what they want. We'll break at this time. Chester.